started sharing ideas through a blog and had people all around the world sort of engage, use them, value these ideas and, uh, and actually send me examples of what their pupils were doing with the ideas. So that was for me the first time in my life where I'd actually found a purpose for writing. Don't stop now, just do it all the time. But the way that it's gone through social media is that, you know, the writing I can then turn into video content and that seems to be engaging with a lot of teachers and sort of share useful ideas for the classroom, but also a lighter, funny side of life as a teacher. Through the use of social media, so the fact we've got Twitter accounts, uh, Facebook page means that we don't have to, you know, unnecessarily sort of print endless uh, sort of letters to parents so keeping connected with our local community through social media has definitely reduced the amount of paper we're printing and the time it takes and same in the classroom so we've got a couple of tools that we use where children have sort of digital portfolios for their work and so it's not always looking at how we can evidence work in books and the time it takes to print photocopy and also looking at things like giving more effective feedback through the, the technology which has had a massive impact uh, not just on workload, but the, obviously the, the, the impact with the pupils. We've got to embrace it because in 2018, we don't have a choice about using the internet. The choice we make is how well we do it. So by embracing social media as a school, it's demonstrating to pupils that actually amazing things can happen. And we've had examples of that where we've been able to connect with the real world through the use of the internet and embed those skills that can actually you know, set children up for life. And we've got to be looking at ways in which we can do that. How can we utilises technology to give children a skill set where they can actually thrive in this very modern and digital world that they're living in. Um, he said, but I've only got three, can you tell me how I can get more subscribers? So straight away, are you doing it safely? Do your mum and dad know what you're posting, etc., etc.? And I said, well, talk me through how you make your videos. Well, I press record and I start talking. So there's the biggest mistake you make, because all these big YouTube stars and vloggers, they don't do that. The first thing that they do is they write down a script that they're going to perform. This is why writing is so incredibly important in school, because it's a starting point to absolutely everything. Not just YouTube videos, Xbox games, PlayStation games, uh, TV shows, cartoons, animations, the films you go and see at the cinema, the songs you hear on the radio, Ed Sheeran gets an idea for a song, what's the first thing he does? Writes it down then he plays it. So this is why writing is so incredibly important because it is a starting point to absolutely everything. But children never get a chance to do that because it's all for assessment. We're getting the children to write to see if they're good at writing. First pack we ever did was one called The Battle Cry. This is the one I'm going to sort of talk through. Um, came about because I watched Braveheart and the freedom speech in Braveheart and I was like, that is amazing. I, got, well, I want my pupils to write a similar sort of text. And so... The children deconstruct the text. This is the reading part. Again, it can be done on paper, or you could do it through apps like Explain Everything, orally through Seesaw, or even apps like Tiny Tap. And then you go into the comparative. So your first one is the freedom speech from Braveheart, edited for the classroom, because in the actual film, he says a bit of a rude word, so you get an edited, clean version. You don't tell them it's from a film called Braveheart, which is a 15, and we shouldn't really watch it, because then they go home, and usually never tell the parents anything, what's happened in their school day, but they'll tell them that. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but just to give you an example, Sons of Scotland, you say, why has he called them Sons of Scotland? Well, he's making that link to family, he's bringing them together, he's trying to get them on side, he's giving them something, some sense of belonging, it'll also remind those soldiers of who else they're fighting for. So children, do you think you could make that link to family in your writing, do you think you can do that? Um, and just to give you an idea of the sort of top-down spag, uh, so they, the soldier says, fight against that, no, we'll run, and we will live. And William Wallace says, yeah, fight and you may die. So you can say, right, what's may an example of, according to our brilliant SPAG curriculum? It's called a modal verb, showing possibility. And in the grand scheme of life, who cares? Because that's not as important as asking, why has he used it? So why has he used it? Well, take that out of the sentence, read that sentence, and would that persuade you to go into battle? Aye, fight and you'll die. What? All right, thanks. Um, and the likelihood is that's what's going to happen. They are going to get annihilated, but he can't say that. What he's got to do is grasp on to that slight chance of hope. And so using the word may, it changes that from it being a certainty to a possibility. Now, how many children in your class are going to want to use a modal verb then? Not because you're telling them to, because they know how to and the impact it will have on the, on the reader. Um, so you do all that deconstruction. That then leads into watching the clip. Now, we've not got time to watch the clip, but you can find it on YouTube if you want to. And the children, you notice we're not jumping into the text. Um, sorry, we're not jumping into the visual. 
we're utilizing that text. So, and I know from deconstructing that text now, it's going to have such an impact on children's writing. All right, because a lot of teachers would jump into the visual, but you're just missing the opportunity there to, you know, really deconstruct a high quality text. So, well, here's an example of some writing that our year five did. This is Dan. Dan's now left our school. He's in year seven. When he was in year six, the teacher said to me, I don't think he's going to be great at depth. I said, what are you talking about? He's got a great natural flair, you know, really imaginative. Yeah, but he's not ticking enough boxes for me to say he's great at depth. So I don't know what to do. Do I force him to write a certain way so he ticks all these boxes? Or do I cross my fingers and hope he doesn't get picked for moderation? We really need to have a serious conversation about how we're doing certain things in our schools, don't we? You tell me this isn't great at depth. Not this, the piece of writing. Don't get me wrong, decent piece of writing. He's applying a lot of what we talked about, repetition for emphasis, exclamation marks, ellipsis, modal verb showing possibilities, stuck one in there. But I'd be cheating Dan and the rest of the class if I got to that point and said, brilliant, I can mark that. I can even highlight it pink and green if we want. No, for Dan and the rest of the class, it was all about getting to this point. It was all about then using the technology to perform and bring it to life. And here we're using some green screen through an app called Doink Green Screen, one of the best apps that I use to allow children just to be anywhere in the world, you know. Um, so I'm going to play you this. And I must watch this a couple of times a week and still get goosebumps. You tell me this isn't great at depth. People of Dame Hugh, our chance has come to stand as one against our sworn foe, Killiston the Devourer. For eons we have done the bidding of this time, been chained by the hands of despair, been crushed by the weight of defeat. No more shall we do his dirty deeds, for we are not slaves, we are people, people with lives and family. I could not lie that some of you will not see the setting sun, hear the tweeting of birds and feel the breeze on your face, but we fight for the greater good. You may not, we may not have their might or experience, but we have hope and most importantly, family, friends and a hope of freedom. If you do this in the future, you won't be considered as people, your legends. As one we will charge. As one, we will bring an end to his reign of terror. As one, we will take this chance. Yeah! How good is that? How good is that? Oh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. So design thinking to me is thinking about the function of what you're designing. So when I look at something, uh, whether we did our uh, 3D printed lightsabers, how were we going to get it to light up? Uh, what were we going to use? Were we going to have to do wiring and program it or were we going to use a flashlight? And with fifth graders, flashlight is a better option. You know, you look at technology, you look at all the things we use on a daily basis um, and it all has a function, it all has a purpose. And so when we're thinking about design, um, people are always thinking about that. And I think the tools that are available now, um, the, the, to, to 3D print something, I, I couldn't do the lightsaber. Um, I could do it out of cardboard, but the long term, you know, it, I mean, it's cool for that five minutes, but I just had a kid bring back to me uh, a lightsaber that the bottom won't come off of it. Well, it was, we fit it a little too tight. So I'll, we'll break off the bottom and then I'll replace the batteries and I'll, put a, I'll print a new one that fits right on it. You know, and that's kind of that design where, um, you know, we couldn't, before we couldn't do those type of things. And with 3D printing, it really allows students to design something and if they fail, that's cool. We'll keep trying until we get it. Now with the, the cost of the filament, cost of the printers, it's down to a point where the schools can afford it and they can do that. So that's, you know, when I think about 3D printing, that design part is very exciting. I'm a FIRST Robotics coach in the United States. We have FIRST Robotics. It's a, worldwide organization. I don't think they have too much of it in the UK, but in the US, like in Michigan, there's uh, 400 teams. And the, um, each team has 10 to 15 kids. We get a box of parts with some motors and they say build a robot. And our robot has to accomplish all these tasks. So the design part of this is essential. We work with a local business who helps us. We give them our input. They then help put us in CAD and get it drawn up correctly. If we need to 3D print parts, we can 3D print parts. Um, and at the end of the day, their design is what's being built. So actually with me being gone this week, I'm missing a big part of it and it's just killing me, but that's all right. So I'm like, I'm bugging my mentor that it's saying, hey, are we, we got all this? He's like, yeah, we're good. Don't worry about it. Um, but 
that design part. So I've had students that um, have been exposed to this and then that helps formulate their career and what they want to do. They're like, oh, you know what? I've, I've drilled parts, I've manufactured, I've, and especially in robotics, they get that hands-on experience that traditional classrooms don't have anymore. Um, and, th and that's unfortunate. And with robotics, I'm able to do that. With other 3D printing, I'm able to put something they made in their hands. And um, we're seeing that start to transfer into um, uh, having more non-traditional, maybe more females in the STEM careers. Um, we're also starting to see some of that transition and it's exciting. You know, if they've, they've never done anything, make it out of cardboard first. You know, we do a lot of stuff on paper where they'll draw it out. I think having that concept um, of having something down on paper, having maybe some type of little prototype built, something that they can refer to as they design, and then as they go and then sit, does that serve that function, then um, the 3D printers, we, we, then where we really start to break it down. And a lot of times, you know, you're going to fail. And I have this Lego jetpack. And I think I went through six revisions till I got to the seventh. And the seventh I really liked. Now, I could then change it and add more things to it. I could get it to high school seniors and say, all right, redesign this, make it better. But they could start with that concept. But I started with trying to make it out of Legos. And that was my original intent. It didn't work. It kept falling apart. And I kept thinking, all right, that back to that design part. If I'm going to use this with elementary students in first through third grade, if I can't figure it out, are they going to be able to? And so that's where I kind of took that concept and I said, all right, and just worked it through. And when I got to the end result, it works really well. Go to the Dremel's website under resources and educator. They have uh, resources for, um, you can start out with elementary or for the, it's for the states, um, elementary or primary. And then um, secondary, um, they have for, even for college and some other institutions, there's lesson plans already right there available to you. Um, they're all approved, they're all been tested through. Great place to start, um, that you don't have to reinvent anything. There's a lot of other 3D um, warehouses out there that have examples um, that you can search. If you just do a search for them, you'll find those. I like all the computer science stuff, and I like um, the integration into um, the coding part. I think for kids, when we look at computer science and coding and hardware and software, I love that combination together. And that's where then 3D printing comes into it. You can add that component to it. But I really love that combining um, that computer science part of it that, you know, because that's what a lot of people's jobs are. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at all the technical stuff you have here for it took up here. You got to be able to connect it. You got to be able to make sure they're working um, correctly. And that's a lot of times, you know, with my students, I'm trying to explain, you know, when you go into a job, I don't care what it is, you're going to have your specialty in your area that you're going to have to have to work together. You know, you're going to have to work with that technology. If you're going into medicine, I guarantee you're going to have a lot of technology you're going to work with. If you're going into sales, you're going to know, have to know how your stuff works. And so um, that's kind of the emphasis, you know, when you think about that. In the classroom, teachers spend a lot of time trying to get the noise down. Most teachers will teach at 10 to 15 decibels over the background sound. So if the background sound is 65 dB, you're in there, you're in there at 80, you're really giving a good old shout, you know. And that's stressful and exhausting. Uh, on the other hand, if you say to the kids, look, you see that old iPad stuck on the wall over there, Mark 1, you know, it's stuck up with Velcro, it's running a free decibel meter. Guys, try and keep it under 70. And um, in fact, you choose what the best number is and they go off do the research and they go you know what as soon as we go over 72 our brains start to fizz a bit and they don't work quite as well as we did and by the way by the way chief we found out that um, we need really good light because once it goes under 500 lux we stop concentrating and before you know where you are you've got a bunch of kids who are concentrating because the environment's good in a room that's quiet because it's their protocols and by the way their learning's got better too you're sitting up the front turning into a kind of a middle-aged version of young Mr. Gray saying, you've all done very well, carry on, you know. This is a school in Dubai. We gave the Learnometer to, they found the CO2 levels were very high in their school. They're circulating the air round and round, refrigerating it, putting it back in, but not bringing in the hot air, 50 degrees outside, not bringing that hot air in. The CO2 was going up and up. They thought, hey, maybe we could use plants 
to turn the CO2 into oxygen. They wrote to NASA. They said to NASA, I bet you're interested in terraforming Mars. If you're interested in terraforming Mars, you must have thought about what the best plants are. And NASA wrote back and said, well, we've got a whole team on that. Nobody's ever asked. How can we help? You know? And of course, the answer was broad-leafed evergreen plants. The shock here, by the way, was that, of course, they cut CO2 massively, 7,000 parts per million down to 1,200 parts per million. The big surprise was the way in which ADHD went down significantly. No, no, three quarter, three, 75% drop. And you start to see now, you know, if we're going to make a difference in our lives, one way we've got to look is freshly at how can we help. People always blame folk for this. They, like, you know, I'm doing all this work as folk watching this will know, looking at the learning environment in the classroom. You know, if you get the CO2 levels right, kids are bright eyed and bushy tailed, you get the lights right, you get the temperature right, it's fabulous. You get it wrong, you've got naughty kids in the corner. You know, Germany is treating kids who have apparently got ADHD. They're putting sand filled waistcoats on them to kind of slow them down. You had 27 pounds of sand filled waistcoats on seven year old babies, you know, and they think, yeah, those kids are a bit pretty. Let's slow them down. We've got to stop blaming and start asking. You know, you're never allowed to change your classroom, but you're always allowed permission to do research. You know, it's fine. So say, I'm really interested in what happens if we get the light levels up in our classroom. I'm really interested in what happens if we ask the kids to write the rules for using mobile phones in the school. I mean, what they'll do is, you know, they'll go to research like some of the stuff we did and say, what are the others all doing? You know, the mobile phone rule is pretty simple. Phone's out on the desk, so nothing bad is happening under the table. Be prepared to share it, really important because not everybody's got one, but also, if I'm going to share my phone with you, I've got to log out of Facebook and I'm, you know, I've got to think about privacy and sharing. And also, you know, if you and I are having a bit of a bit of a set to, um, I don't want to have that publicly in the phone that I'm using. So I have to think about social manners. This is about good manners with my phone. So phone's on the desk, use it, be prepared to share it with not everybody, but with others. And third rule, key one, if you've taken the trouble to bring it, Surely to goodness the school will give you something to do with it that you couldn't have otherwise done. Right now in society, we're seeing this maker movement sort of uh, gain a lot of traction. And this is the idea that as society, we've been consumers, but how do we actually change our environment? How do we make new products, new ideas, new concepts? How do we get hands-on engaged in doing that? In the communities, these are engaging people to be passionate about projects, to learn new tools and technologies, to share their ideas with each other. All things that in education, we want to see in our classrooms. We want students to learn from each other. We want them to be engaged and doing hands-on work. And so schools are looking towards these community-based makerspaces and then bringing those into education. So they're converting libraries, uh, upgrading them for the 21st century, redoing the wood, old wood shop to now be a high-tech makerspace, or even just a teacher converting their own classroom into a makerspace by changing the equipment around the edge of the room to support students in doing hands-on project-based learning around projects that are personally relevant and still addressing the core content that teachers need to cover throughout the day. So the big issues we see with this idea of open-ended project-based learning is teachers are nervous because they're receiving so much pressure from administration, from parents, from, from the ministries about the core content that they have to uh, still cover. The most efficient way to cover core content is just by lecturing, to tell the students the content. But we, research shows that that's not a lasting way that students actually learn. Students learn by engaging and doing hands-on projects. And so the idea of taking a makerspace, a place where students can physically make their uh, own conceptions of what the core content is, bringing that into the classroom then has more lasting effect on the core content that we believe students need to retain to make them productive members of society. So there's a lot of barriers, some of them real and some of them just perceived to actually implementing educational makerspaces. One is this idea of time. Teachers are so constrained by time 
But the beauty of maker activities is you can actually do one activity that covers multiple content areas simultaneously while also building 21st century skills. And so while you might only have 45 minutes to do an activity, you're not just teaching one concept, but you might be teaching a whole range of content simultaneously. The second thing is that this idea that an educational makerspace has to be high tech. That's not true. A makerspace just leverages the materials around us to create new inventions and be creative problem solvers. And so that can be with 3D printers and laser cutters, but it could also be with just Lego bricks, uh, cardboard, tape, whatever it might be that you might already have within your classroom. So converting your educational environment into a makerspace does not necessarily require a big budget in new equipment. You can often just do it with uh, the materials you have. It's more of almost a mindset shift that teachers have to go through. So an advice to a teacher is really thinking about who is your community of learners? Who, who are you trying to reach? Because you have to understand them in order to be able to adapt your lessons to tap into what they're going to be engaged in actually making. And second is, there's lots of resources out there. Lego Education has a whole set of maker activities at legoeducation.com slash maker. These are free activities that teachers can download with teacher lesson plans, suggested ways of implementing this in the classroom, both using Lego bricks and then combining that with all kinds of classroom materials teachers already have. And so there's, the excitement around the maker movement has produced a lot of online materials that are free and open source that allow teachers to get started right away in implementing making into their education. Take the example of a classroom with 30, 30 students and you equip each one of those students with a very, very expensive laptop, whether it's a MacBook or a PC or whatever it may be. The amount of development that happens for those portable devices, and I'm describing PCs and MacBooks and you know Chromebooks as portable devices. You put them on a desk, they've got a keyboard, you type on it, and that's the only way that you can really use them. Um, there, there's very little development happening for those devices in the world. Whereas if you look at mobile environments, if you take an iPad, if you take a tablet, um, you find that there's, it's usually connected to an app store. There's a camera on the back of it. I can take a picture here, I can take a picture there. Somebody will come to me and say, hey, there's an app for this that never existed in the past. You know, The world that we live in and the big businesses that we kind of uh, come across are developing for that kind of device and that kind of environment. I could have gone for an even more expensive kind of environment and equipped everyone with a very expensive laptop, but I would not have had the foundation to be able to develop and innovate and try new things the way in which I can with mobile devices. I think it's a cultural change. I think it means people have to stop and unlearn and relearn. You know, because the way I used to save my documents on a laptop is very different from the way I'm doing it on my mobile device. You know, the way that my furniture is arranged in the classroom is different from when I used to use laptop trolleys to now when we have mobile devices, you know. Um, so it is a cultural change and it's a different kind of investment and, you know, it affects pedagogy. There are new pedagogies that are emanating from the use of mobile technology. Um, compared to what we had in the past using just portable devices or worse still where we invested in computer rooms and we all went to that computer room to do a specific task you know which kind of seems very very um, kind of old and dated but there are schools that are still investing in that resource a slide comes up it's got some really useful information a great infographic and suddenly you see devices come out and everybody's taking pictures. We're beginning to see that in schools. Where this is enabled in a school environment, the children don't feel the need to take the notes from a screen. I'll take out my iPad and I'll just take a picture. And then I'll annotate on top to make it very personal to me. So that kind of pedagogy is very different. You know, it's no longer about finding the right information, it's about asking the right question. And that is now become kind of almost a fundamental skill. Can your children ask the right questions? 
can they find the right answers and so on and i think that that mobility element is really kind of allowing for that change we've also moved into this environment where authentic engagement has been very much based on creativity so sometimes when i make a statement like that people think hey you know is this kind of how can this be applied to mathematics or how can this be applied to a student that's about to sit their gcse exams you know um but we're seeing kind of the, some of the best kind of activities that have been set by teachers you know where they're looking up photosynthesis and the children have to use plasticine or play-doh to model that process and animate it and they, they can only do that if cognitively they've really understood that really well and then the teachers ask them to overlay their voice and explain what's going on so the idea of copying and pasting something from somebody is just not possible we've introduced this system whereby you know in our bid to reduce teacher workload um, we use a tool that allows us to not necessarily mark books but give voice feedback so the children will still write in exercise books and in the class the teachers will go around and correct but when it needs to be marked as in traditionally marked the children will take out their devices and they will take a picture and they will upload it to the teacher and the teacher is able to look at their written work and just tap and speak as soon as they tap the screen it comes up with a recording tool and they just record their voice and they give voice feedback and one thing that i find really fascinating is that if you had to give the same feedback to three different children and you had to do it traditionally by marking a book you would be writing the same thing but when you are giving voice feedback to three children you're saying the same thing but you it's almost impossible to say exactly the same thing because psychologically you connecting with that child you know that child you've got different intonations and so on and this for me is kind of a very powerful shift in the way in which we give feedback because i think the best some of the best uses of technology is when it brings humans together the CPD will, I think, tends to pop up on pretty much every level. And I think that um, for me, um, some of the things that we introduced was around changing the way we do CPD. So the allocation in the school week. And I suppose the thinking went something like this, that if you look at the school timetable in a week, mathematics is on there because it's really important and it has to be on there. Yeah. And all the other subjects are on there because it's really important. It has to be on there. So we decided to ask the question, where's CPD on that weekly session? Yeah. If it's really important, why isn't it on the timetable? Yeah. So then we had to have a lot of discussions about how we could potentially move to a, a timetable that had the CPD built in. So we ended up getting rid of the inset days, joining the time together, making a few adjustments, adjustments here and there. And we have professional development on a, every week on a Friday afternoon. Thank and that involves everyone, caretakers, cleaners, the people in the, in the kitchen, the IT, it involves everyone. And there are times when everybody has to be together. But actually, there are times when it's very, very differentiated, which is what we would do in the classroom. It's a great learning experience. What I also find is that when that time was given and we gave that freedom and that trust to teachers to come up with what it is that they wanted, uh, there were some really quite fascinating things. So they have like a five minute session um, on the one best thing. What's the one best thing that I've kind of discovered this week? But then they also came up with a five minute session on my one best failure. Oh, yeah. What didn't work? And I found that to be hugely kind of operationally efficient because if I've said this, this hasn't worked, other people can benefit from all this challenge. And the quality of conversation that happens when those people are together in a room, it's pretty fascinating. It, it's fantastic to kind of have that. And the conversations are not about technology. They're about pedagogy and classroom and, and learning and so on. So I think getting the, just having that time for teachers and, you know, non-teaching staff to just sit together and reflect and think over a coffee on a weekly basis, I think there's something hugely, hugely powerful mm. about that. There's some of the most successful companies that we see, Google and other kind of organization, we kind of see that culture where, you know, they, they, they introduce planned coincidences 
you know we put this water cooler here and everybody's gonna come here and guess what that place and that place are gonna come and bump into one another and there'll be great conversations that happen here but there will be school leaders who are fantastic at their their roles and and visionaries in many ways but technology might not be their thing if you want but I kind of feel in order to reduce workload and get efficiency and because of the world that we live in today it's almost a non-negotiable that you've got to understand you know aspects of technology and how that's going to impact and I just don't know where current school leaders new school leaders would go to kind of get clarity to kind of get ideas to get inspiration uh, in terms of you know understanding how they make their organizations more efficient reduce workload it's no longer about doing long hours and that equating to I'm working very hard you can do things very quickly and efficiently and be just as good um, and I think that, that there's, there's that kind of paradigm shift that still needs to happen at leadership level